Morrill's tartan vision, the royal family have helped to create Scotland the historic myth. In turn, Balmoral has become a sanctuary from modern Britain, where the monarchy can enjoy an ancient world of royalty. The Queen keeps her opinions to herself, and she's a model of discretion and grace. Until Sunday, when she reportedly commented on it after a morning church service near her Balmoral estate in Scotland. The Times newspaper says she told someone in the crowd, Think very carefully about how you answer the next question. Though you are a constitutional monarch, and therefore you should be seen to be above politics, to be seen to be neutral in these matters, perhaps expressing yourself personally to a group of well-wishers and onlookers who have come to view what she's doing on the Balmoral estate might just be allowable. Because after all, Her Majesty has come in and out of that estate state before without saying anything. My hope is simply for a yes vote to happen. I've been talking tonight about childhood and how we, we tend to make the influences that will come back and bite our children in the arse when they're older. And that is why we should take care with the literature we give children, with the words we use with them, by the things we deem permissible for them. Anything should be possible. That includes things which don't belong to traditionally what you think your class is, or your nationality is, or your political affiliations. Everything must be open. Everything must have a warm yes inside it. That way you get an interesting populace. They may be harder to govern, but they're more interesting people and they know more stuff, and they are more self-confident, so they will make more of government. But that doesn't matter so much as the striving. Just the feeling that your vote might mean some, something <laughs> for once, that it actually might mean something. I think I'd be very moved by that alone. I had built it in my own head as the greatest day of my life because I, I love voting. It felt like the culmination of a long, long, hard struggle. Although I'd enjoyed it intensely and, you know, travelled Scotland met some fantastic people, you know, and groups of people, big groups of people, really proud to be Scots and with a, a new sense of vigour about being Scottish. They lo people loved the referendum event. I mean, it may be quite gruelling in a way, and if you're a no, I think, you know, I know no people who just hated it from start to finish and couldn't wait for the whole thing to be over. To be honest, it was a very odd week for me. Andy died on the 3rd of September. Um, so... Then I, I was organising a funeral, obviously, um, and grieving for him. So it, it was a whole kind of surreal time for me. I wrote a blog post when the, the vote came in, it was called The Tide Goes Out. And I actually wrote that during the day of the vote. And I'd, I'd gone down to George Square. And it was full of all these happy people, you know. But I don't, I don't know why, but I just had this really bad feeling. I just knew we've not won this. What we were all doing at that time was you counted the yes signs in the windows everywhere you went. And it all gave us a, a sense of solidarity. And I cycled the length of the street, which is something like three quarters of a mile long. There was nothing. Not no signs either, by the way, but nothing in any single window all the way through. And at the end of that road, I had a very creepy feeling that people who had something, a stake in society that they did not want to lose, were saying to themselves, I may like this idea, but you know what? I can't afford to take that risk. And I think, I think that's eventually what did for it. And a lot of the people who did vote no were older, and they were, you know, Middle Scotland, they're professional people, people with an income who were worried that uh, things would go, the, the economy would, would go badly. And I think that uh, that probably was the biggest individual failure in the Yes campaign. We did not win the economic war. The people of Scotland have voted in record numbers on the future of their nation. Will they make history by choosing the path of independence? One of my theories about uh, this is that uh, it's not so much unionists against nationalists, 
a lot of the people that I know on the nationalist side, I would say, were by instinct uh, antsy. They're there's something about them which is a bit rebellious. They don't take at face value what they're told. They are the challengers, the scrutineers, the questioners. And there is a tendency on the other side. It's not a lack of intelligence or insight at all. I'm not saying that. But there is a point reached where, with some people, where if you push hard enough, their instinct is to assimilate. You don't take on the boss. People who, even if they're in a union, are the ones who will vote against the strike. That is one of the big divides in society, and I think it's a big divide in our debate between assimilators, people who, whatever their misgivings about the union, I don't think many people in Britain actually love the union. I think some do, but not, not many. They have doubts about it. They're very uncertain. But when push comes to shove, when the, you know, the Bank of England, when the Royal Bank of Scotland, when the UK government, when international institutions, NATO, are saying you might not get in, they're the people who's eventual reaction is to collapse and say, OK, I get the message. But people on the yes side are the ones who are saying, no, no, there is something fundamentally wrong here. I don't believe this. You know, I have this idea, this belief in a cause. And that's what carries you through. And I mean, that's why uh, people on the no side, you know, they call you a Mooney or, you know, you're a kind of swivel-eyed adherent of some kind. Uh, because you have to have belief. And, and it's true. Uh, you have to believe that uh, irrespective of what people are telling you, your belief can overcome that. And otherwise, I mean, you wouldn't have nationalist movements. There wouldn't be a trade union movement. Our first result in at 27 minutes past one in the morning in this uh, Scottish independence referendum. And it is the smallest local authority, it's Clackmannanshire, voting no. I didn't actually watch the results, Commander. As soon as I, I saw the very beginning and... I think it was client manager, and we really needed to win there if we were going to win, and we didn't win. And I just knew that's it. So I just I turned the sound off the TV. I just couldn't bear to listen to them crowing about it. And I didn't watch the telly for the next couple of days. And that night I went to bed, and I mean I wakened up in the early hours and put on the radio, and I could hear by the tone without any of the detail what had happened. I just switched off again and went back to sleep. It took me a week to wake up. But also I knew that it was a pyrrhic victory, that they'd won at the price of destroying themselves. So I kind of took some satisfaction from that, and what's happened since, I think, has borne that out, that they did destroy themselves in order to secure that victory. I think the realisation that you know this, this event, this historic event, that we'd failed uh, was such a sense of emptiness. I mean, I, I thought we would win. I genuinely thought we'd win. And some of the reports that I was getting that were coming to me via other people around the country were indicating it might not just be squeaking a win. It might, you know, if it went, it could go quite, quite solidly. And none of that happened. Um, and plus, I think the humiliation of realising that the Scots are probably the only people in history to vote against their own independence. Which makes you wonder, who the hell are we? What are we, the Scots? I find that quite hurtful, actually. I mean, I, I understand why people voted against it, but as a Scot, I find it inexplicable. Even if you thought that your own wallet was going to take a hit, what kind of man votes against his own country? Which is how I perceived it. I think all of us felt almost like it was a bereavement, but I think you have to take a step back and remember that, in a way, the No campaign had more to lose than we did, because if they had lost then Scotland would have become an independent country and barring something very improbable, there would have been no going back. Whereas we can move on. Scotland has changed forever. There's no going back uh, to the uh, time before this referendum and just having business as usual. The status quo has not got any kind of endorsement or mandate tonight and politicians have to absolutely understand that. I think you can almost look at this campaign in retrospect as one that the, the no side always had the opportunity to win because there was always something they could offer that was likely to make voters think well we'll try this package and you know we don't have to go to the full independence we can try this package so you could almost look at what happens as like a kind of um, a game where a card game where the no campaign were trying to get away with the lowest possible bid that they could 
and still achieve victory. What was more of an effect and what I found quite interesting was that of the small number of people who said they wouldn't vote and who actually did vote, they seemed to break 80-20 to no sort of natural anti-independence types but just weren't taking the referendum seriously and then at the death, at the close of the campaign, they thought, ah, actually, it's looking quite close now and they, they were suddenly galvanised to come out and vote. And the other thing that happened was differential turnout and this was a problem that probably in our heart of hearts we probably knew was likely what, because just because of the type of people who were natural yes voters, um, working class people who are less likely to vote in a general election. It's not that they weren't interested, but if you don't have that culture, that ingrained culture of going out to vote, it's harder to get the vote out. And certainly Glasgow and Dundee, uh, which both voted yes, um, the turnout was lower than elsewhere. There are various ways of interpreting this result. You could interpret it as David Cameron has tried to interpret it and trying it on a little bit as the settled will of the Scottish people. It's a very odd sort of settled will where people are making up their minds in the last week and there were opinion polls putting yes ahead. That's not settled. That's not Settled means not subject to fluctuation or change. I think it's hard to say that's a settled will of the Scottish people and that this can't be revisited at some point in the future. And in a way, it's just a question of how soon and in what way it's put to the test again. Well, I think what we gained was we didn't go into a trough uh, like 79. I mean, it, it was extraordinary that it, it seemed to be just the start of something, not the end of something. That was the amazing thing about it. You can't unleash that amount of energy and involvement and expect it just to go away. And I know, I mean, that's what the unionists wanted. They wanted it just to go away. And if they'd secured what they'd wanted to secure at the beginning of the campaign, when they'd been talking in terms of 70%, no, that's what they'd, you know, they'd been forecasting when the campaign started. It probably would have gone away, and it would have gone away for a generation, but I think it was because we were so near that people thought, well, no, that we are still within shouting distance of this. And the vote, the no vote was secured on the back of certain promises. It was certainly part of the anti-independence campaign's pitch that um, voting no was a way to keep Scotland in the EU. So if, if the UK as a whole votes to leave the, leave the EU, but if Scotland votes to stay in, then that might be a perfectly plausible pretext for holding a second referendum a bit sooner than we think. The other reason would be if if it's clear that this vow that the parties have made is reneged upon, then again, that obviously means the terms on which we vote, voted no no longer apply. Because the one thing that is absolutely clear is you can say that Scotland voted against independence, you can't say that Scotland voted against Devo Max. And I think you can actually make a very credible case that we voted in favour of Devo Max. Because when you have 45% of the entire electorate vo voting for full sovereign independence, and according to the Ashcroft exit poll, there was a further 14% of the electorate that voted no on the specific basis that substantial powers would be granted, then it seems clear that the, um, the centre of gravity, you know, 59% total of the electorate, were voting for substantial powers. You also can look at the statements that the, that the London parties made during the, the referendum. For example, Gordon Brown said that if there was a no vote, there would, that would result in a system that was as close to federalism as, as, as was possible in a country like the UK, which implies something extremely close to Devo Max. And also George Galloway, who normally you wouldn't think he was speaking on behalf of anyone but himself, but in fact he was the, the official designated representative of Better Together. And he specifically said that not only was Devo Max on offer, but something that he called Devo Supermax. I mean, if Devo Max is, is commonly defined as the devolution of everything apart from foreign affairs and defence, the mind boggles as to what Devo Supermax is, but certainly that's what George Galloway promised, and nobody from Better Together said, actually, he spoke out of turn, that doesn't apply, so that is a pledge that they made, and um, I think the, what we've now got to do is to keep them to the promises they've made, whether they intended to make them or not, what they said is on the, is on the record. And we know what they're like in Westminster. We know that they lie. Because we've, we've, we've seen this too often before. I remember, you know, I was one of the idiots that voted Labour in 1997. 
and I remember all the promises that were made then, that they were going to abolish the House of Lords, they were going to get proportional representation, they were going to get this, that and the other, and look what happened, you know, so they made promises, they made this, we had this infamous vow, and yeah, we're, we're going to make sure that they, they're held to it, that we hold them to account, and I think that was the main feeling in the, the immediate aftermath of the vote, it was, right, okay, we're going to hold you to account, we're going to make sure that you are as good as your miserable word, your miserable lying word, we're going to hold you to that. We'll never go away, we'll never always will. be here, and the feeling will only grow, and see you next year when the austerity cuts come in, you know what, I embrace it, fucking let's go, the Tories, fuck us up, see all the pain and the hassle he's all caused, embrace it and enjoy it, because you've caused it, not us, we tried to change, you didn't want it, that's the game, yeah. and that's as simple as that, and I embrace it, give us every austerity measure possible, taxes to fuck, Give us every horrible measure you can contemplate from Westminster and I embrace it, every single one of them. Let's rock and roll. Fuck it. Let's go for it. The place for a time and a place for And we're held with them. Hold my hand And I'll take you there Somehow Someday For me, the real surprise was the morning after, I think, when Cameron Cameron's first act was to say, that's the Scots stuffed, now let's make sure England gets its pennies worth as well. We have heard the voice of Scotland, and now the millions of voices of England must also be heard. The question of English votes for English laws, the so-called West Lothian question, requires a decisive answer. And it made you realise that actually it's not about us at all. We are way down the list, and we'll stay down the list as well. Uh, you know, it's only when you can threaten the British state that the British state reacts and gives you anything at all. I think this idea that Salmond is, is demonised and is not liked is completely mistaken. There's no opinion polling to back that up that I know of. Um, they, despite the attempted denigration by the, you know, the, some of the bigots with laptops in the media, the most successful politician in Scotland's post-war history. I mean, he eclipses all of them, including Brown. Uh, I mean, I, I think Salmond has to be put beside Tom Johnson as, uh, as perhaps the greatest uh, politician, you know, of the, of the era. Tom Johnson's getting a wee bit past that era now. And I'm not a member of the SNP, but the effect of that overwhelming victory for the SNP in 2011 was so massive and so unexpected that, and, and of, because of its implication of a referendum, I think there was this, there was just a sort of communal sense of understanding that things had to be done just from the people that you were speaking to. There was this, there were so many conversations started happening about what independence might mean. I think the referendum came as a bit of a surprise to the SNP and the Scottish Government. They broke the system. So we were starting off from a very low base point, but we're still starting off from, from a situation where for an awful lot of people, I mean, I'm, I'm not that old, but uh, I can remember when I was young, 
the idea of Scottish independence was really something that only, it was kind of a lunatic fringe idea, it was a fantasy that it wasn't serious politics, the idea of Scottish independence. And what we had to do was to normalise the idea of, of independence and to bring it into the mainstream of political discourse. And the, the, certainly the, the independence referendum succeeded magnificently in doing that. But the real point is this. The real guardians of progress are no longer politicians at Westminster or even at Holyrood, but the energised activism of tens of thousands of people who I predict will refuse to meekly go back into the political shadows. It got people interested and energised, and even though people didn't necessarily agree, they were talking about things. You know, they were talking about Scotland, they were talking about their country, they were talking about the future. And they actually, I mean, especially in the East End of Glasgow, it's a very, people have been very cynical and negative because they've had hope beaten out of them for generations. And it reignited hope in this community. And I honestly never thought I would see that happen and it's such a wonderful and positive thing. Particularly the way in which a lot of it didn't just come from party politics, I think was a really important thing. The idea that it was related to culture and writing and bigger ideas about what people in Scotland might want a society to be, that was a really energising thing to experience. The position is this, we lost the referendum vote, but Scotland can still carry the political initiative. Scotland can still emerge as the real winner. I don't want to deal with how you look down. That doesn't lead anywhere. I've been down to the bottom of that. What interests me is what encourages you to look up. And it's not about winning. It's not about coming through the other end. It is the positivity. It is the possibility. I think the referendum equaled and still does hope. I think collectively we, we look at each other and we look at the country that we live in in a different way, in a transformed way. And that to me is what the whole experience was about. We can be quite negative and pessimistic, I think. I think that is a part of Scottish culture. But the independence referendum taught us that it doesn't have to be like that. And it's up to us to make a difference. And we can make a difference.